Sarah Obad, we joined by another Horse Racing Nation family member here with Ed DeRosa and neither of us at HRN HQ this time, but obviously with all the Breeders' Cup stuff coming up, we have to talk together about the biggest one, the classic. And while we're both flight line stands, we have some we have some other takes for a little bit of a underneath value perhaps and i feel like we have to give this rest of the the field some the respect that they deserve and talk about uh multiple horses in this spot even though we're we're both a little starstruck well and you and i are horse players we're better so of course uh that's what we think of really when any race comes up how are we going to bet it who are we going to pick etc but as industry people, it's impossible to ignore that the classic does have a big, big say on horse of the year and other championships. And there are some storylines when it comes to this race in that regard as well. I mean, we saw Medina Spirit last year, who I will go to my grave saying was ridden to be second and win, which he didn't end up. Did he win? I don't even know who was the champion three-year-old last year, but that was the point of him being raced that way. And I do not think we're going to see that from Taba or Epicenter. I think they are both there to upset the apple cart, but I wouldn't be shocked if Rich Strike, if they say, hey, if we can be second, we can make a case for champion three-year-old. So there's some storylines beyond the wagering, but of course, flight line and what price he'll ultimately be is a big topic of conversation. So much so that you did a fair art Fair Odds article about the Classic, as well as all of the other Breeders' Cup races. And how low will you go for Flightline as far as the wind pool? I had him at four to five before the draw, just because I wanted to leave some wiggle room. If A, he came out altogether, I didn't want to basically have two thirds of my points tied up with one horse. Uh, B, I still only dropped him to three to five. And admittedly, part of that, Sarah, was just Making him one to two, which granted is only five points in the other direction, but having to take that away from other horses, I just found myself like there's no way I can make an honest case that Taba and Life is Good and Epicenter are all 12 to one to win this race. It, it just didn't make sense to me for them to be that high. And instead of making Happy Saver or Hot Rod Charlie, some ridiculous price that also would have been equally ridiculous in my mind. I decided to just say, call it three to five. But when the, the board opens and he's one to two or two to five, I'm not going to be surprised. And full disclosure, that's not going to keep me from betting flight line. I don't think I'll have him to win if he's one to two or two to five. But I'm really not going to chase other horses on top unless it's something really ridiculous. Like if Tabe is 15 to one, then I'll have to rethink about it. But three to five on my line, fully expecting one to two or two to five. And I'm still not trying to beat him. And I think too, obviously you've been around um, in racing professionally longer than I have. And also as a fan too, we given the age discrepancy, which I won't blow up your spot, but it's, it's just a true fact of the matter. And to have a horse like this, where I think maybe, a more casual fan doesn't necessarily um, understand why the entire media is just so gaga over one horse with with a group that, let's say, a different year, you could make a case for really any of them to perhaps be the favorite in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Um, maybe not all of them, but definitely some of them, um, with, especially with a horse like Life is Good, with Epicenter, with Taba, with even Rich Strike. Maybe there's a year where your Kentucky Derby winner that's gone on to um, – run maybe better than some expected. Maybe uh, that's too generous uh, for others, people's points of view. But this is a good group as far as the classic goes. And we've seen renditions of this race that are not filled with the same caliber of horses that Flightline will be taking on in this spot. But circling back to the point of what I was trying to say is this is a very special horse from what we've seen from him so far, visually, as well as on all sorts of figures, whether it's Bayer, Brisnet, Thoroughgraph, Ragazin, whatever it is that you're looking at, this is a horse of our lifetimes. And I think that when you have something like that, that is so special, um, all the other horses are really great horses, but they're not flight line and they haven't done what he's done um, in, in all of those aspects as far as what you see and, and then the data that you see behind it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I 
even going back to Zenyatta, who I would say certainly probably had the esteem, even more than Justify and maybe same with American Pharaoh, but she got beat. But, you know, there were questions given her running style and it was only the, was that the second time she had faced males? And I, I guess Flightline has some very minor questions related to travel to go a mile and a quarter. And yes, this field is better than the Pacific Classic, but you know, he did beat the Dubai World Cup winner by 19 lengths. And I would say the Dubai World Cup is more prestigious than any race that any of these horses that are in this race have won, um, or at least in terms of prestige with who you expect in the field. The Derby's the best, but you know, that's for three-year-olds and not the Dubai World Cup. So yeah, I mean, you, you hit on all the points and why it's exciting and, you know, why there's that tension because still at the end of the day, he has to load in the gate and he actually has to prove it on the track. And with horse racing, that's where the rubber meets the road because these horses do get beat. Uh, we saw it with Baid uh, just a couple of weeks ago on an international level. Um, we saw it with Black Caviar, who is not invincible. We didn't see it with Winx when she got going, but that's part of what made her so special is she just kept winning at these big races. So it's uh, it, it's truly once uh, in a generation to get a horse like this. Um, you know, I would say go Zapper for me, Zenyatta, Wise Dan, Rachel Alexander, like these are horses that reached that level, but they did it. A, they raced more. Flight line is just pure talent is what people gravitate toward more than like Cigar who had that win streak. So it's a little different. The game's a little different. But if he wins the Classic like he won the Pacific Classic, it would be hard to say that he's not the best since bid. Pretty high praise there. We'll touch on some of the other horses in this race because this is not a one horse race and he does yeah. still have to do it. I think there's this narrative out there that some people um, really believe that life is good and flight line are going to be hooking up early and life is good is going to have to rate behind flight line. That doesn't really make sense to me because life is good can be in front of flight line and flight line can rate and he has done so successfully. So why would he try to go play life is good's game early on? I don't see life is good um, tearing away from this field and having a massive lead. Flight line is just a very fast horse. Naturally, he's not going to let that happen. But I don't think that there is um, this part of the, the the puzzle doesn't have to happen. Um, as far as things that Flightline has to do to get the win here. I don't think that he has to go toe-to-toe -to -toe early all the way around the track with Life is Good and hope that one of them burns out. It could happen that way, but I don't think that that's necessarily Flightline's path to success or the likely path that he's going to take to reach the winner's circle. I agree, uh, I would say completely. Uh, the, the two things I go back to with Flightline, the Met Mile, where he broke, it poorly seems a little strong. It wasn't an ideal break, though, for his first race as a four-year-old, shipping, off the bench, all that. That's not ideal. And then he ended up inside behind a horse who definitely ended up with the tactical advantage in Speaker's Corner. And John Embriel, he tried to set the stage. I don't blame him. That's his job. Um, it, you know, it looked like there may be a race on as they turn for home. And Speaker's Corner offered absolutely no response. And that is no, that's not against Speaker's Corner. We've just learned some thought going in beforehand, but that there would be no response. Flight line is just that much better. And the Pacific Classics the same way. I mean, if Flavian wanted to win that race gate to wire, if that was, hey, we need you on the lead at all times, he would have been on the lead and he would have won the race. But there was no rush. He just got his position. And again, when the question was asked and flight line went on with it, there was no response. Country Grammar was not keeping up. I forget who the pace setter was, but he was dusted within seconds. And I would expect something similar in the classic. If they want to be on the lead, like an American Pharaoh type trip or close to it, they can have that trip. If they want to sit off a little bit, they'll do that. I'm expecting no response for life is good once flight line decides it's time to go, once Flavian decides to go on flight line. But I do think life is good can be second. Uh, 
I think if he tries to run with flight line, that will compromise his chances to be second. If he just lets him go and runs his race as if flight line's not in it, he's the second best horse in the race. And that's, as I'm sure we'll get to, why I'm playing it the way I am. But from a flight line perspective, he can be on the lead if that's what they want. If they say, hey, there's no trouble if you're on the lead, just go gate to wire, win the race. They can do that. But I'm expecting a Met Mile or Pacific Classic type trip where he's a little bit wide just to stay out of trouble. And then down the backside, it's lights out. I'm with you on that. I know you have more interest in this race um, as far as life is good goes than I do, perhaps. And I know something that you mentioned a couple of times is that last year you were kind of a little cold on life is good going into the dirt mile because he had a little bit of a regression with his prep for that race, having um, faced kind of questionable competition and not really running the same uh, brilliant race that we are used to seeing from him going in and then absolutely dominant in the dirt mile. Now, the Woodward, I think, is kind Kind of uh, the the last uh, idea of life is good that a lot of people have going into this race, and it's not necessarily a good one that tells you that he's going to be able to finish ahead of a horse like Flightline with what we saw in his last prep prior to this race. Um, let's say best case scenario, life is good really didn't appreciate the off going, and they were looking to save something uh, in reserve for this race going in. The distance, obviously, a question since he hasn't had success at it yet, but it's not as though he was nowhere when he tried this for the first time over in Dubai going the mile and a quarter. He finished fourth after setting a pretty legitimate uh, pace on a track that was very deep for those horses. So uh, I don't know that he um, is is necessarily the all or nothing, but I I think that some of the horses that can run late uh, should get the setup that they prefer to do so. And that's kind of where I'm looking Um, I know a horse that neither of us are really interested in um, and that a lot of people haven't really talked about is Olympiad. And I think he's one of those that there would be a year where he was the favorite going into this race. Um, Other than kind of a a lackluster Whitney, he hasn't really done much wrong at all. He's just um, in a year like this, he's he's not fast enough on paper as some of these other horses. Yeah, it's interesting what a horse like Flightline does to how people process the race, because if Flightline weren't here, We'd be talking about life is good, vulnerable at the distance, perhaps. Taba, uh, still a lot to do as a three-year-old. I mean, he does have he does have more grade one wins than Epicenter, but I would say Epicenter more accomplished, uh, longer or more developed career at this point. And Olympiad, I think, would be uh, a very sexy, wise guy horse as the fourth choice. Stands for, if Flightline weren't here and Olympiad were the fourth choice, you'd be hearing a lot more about Olympiad. But now we have flight line. A lot of people are picking, understandably so. And then it's like, well, which of the three can I lean on and, you know, maybe try to make something out of being really narrow underneath flight line? And Olympiad seems forgotten. Uh, but I will go back to kind of how we introduced the race. If Olympiad wins this, he is horse of the year. As oh, would yes. be at the center, Taba, maybe, Rich Strike, whatever. So There is a big incentive in addition to the $6 million purse, but there is absolutely something on the line for a horse like Olympiad in the Breeders' Cup to win champion older male, horse of the year, and it would be a pretty incredible campaign if he did and knocking off flight line in the process. As you noted, though, the speed figures, I mean, compared to flight line especially, just aren't there. And other than the Stephen Foster, I was never like, wow, this is really a true older male that can contend at this level. So he hasn't passed that personal test for me, but at the same time, it just shows you how special the Breeders' Cup is because a horse like that is a legitimate off the radar fifth choice in this group. And I think too, there's um there's a lot less conversation about him because there there is such a fan base for horses like Hot Rod Charlie and Rich Strike, who I don't think have a chance in this race. And I know you don't either, but I think a horse like Olympiad kind of falls off the map a little bit because these horses are um, such pets to other people. And I, you know, I'm guilty of that too, or I have an affinity for a certain horse and then I can kind of, uh, you know, put on my rose color colored glasses and make a case for them in a lot of spots. But I mean, logically speaking, these two, uh, they just don't stack up in a race like this. I know there's a lot of people saying, well, Rich Strike can hit the board because of, you know, the way the pace might set up. 
and you know maybe he does but he's yeah. <laughs> he's he's not for either you or I um and it, I think it's that really hard to count him out of third completely but is a better knowing that a lot of people are thinking oh he's gonna close he could get third or people are going to use all in third because they just have flight line on top. You know, to me, it's you, you just have to let him beat you. And then, you know, when he's third beating 15 and everyone says he validates his existence, um, you just have to say, just swallow it and be okay with that. But yeah, not for me. And I mean, I think in a way, Steve Asperson has to be so frustrated with how this year went for a horse like Epicenter because you, know, you have second in the, the Kentucky Derby, second in the Preakness. Uh, you have a horse that then came back and won the Jim Dandy and the Travers. I don't want to take anything away from him. Um, but with the the group that we have assembled here, you kind of uh, you take a little bit to get to him, too. Although I know there's, um, there's a I lot do. of love for him as well as Taba, too. I mean, uh, another one that I'm not interested in underneath, but there's a lot of Taba fans out there that really got attached to the brilliance that he showed very early in his career. Uh, I remember at one point within the Kentucky Derby wagering, he was the favorite uh, going into that race too uh, for post 12 when he was transferred to the Tim Yak team barn. So I get why people want to make cases for these horses because honestly, they're unlikely to get a price like this on them ever again. If you <laughs> like this horse and you really think that they have a chance, I mean, everybody Great outside point. of Flightline is a dream price that maybe you wouldn't see at another time. And while I understand wanting to take advantage of that scenario, I think that you also have to be a little bit realistic about why they are that price and who else is going to be in this race. But I'm a little interested in the longest shot in the field underneath. And we're looking at the horse who has come the closest to flight line so far. And that's happy saber. Um, in that met mile, he ended up finishing second to him. He went on to finish second to life is good. So he's faced them both and it didn't ruin his career. Like it did to speaker's corner to do so. I mean, he has a, a different running style than they do. I think that you can look at the Lucas classic and see that um, with all the commotion, as far as the ride and the saddle slip and the elbowing and the, the shoes and the whole drama, you do also see rich strike um, come over a little bit on happy saver and make things at least uncomfortable for him kind of hampering his way through and getting a clear run in that spot. So I don't hold it against him too much. And as the longest shot in the field to be second and come close to horses like flight line and life is good. If you like them, why not happy saver underneath? Why not? Uh, I tentatively had slotted third in terms of a, you know, rank system I don't love the quarter crack. I mean, he literally did not train today, which is we're recording on Wednesday. So three days from the classic that there's no positive spin to that. Uh, other than I will say Todd being willing to say, yeah, we're going to patch it up. We still want to be in the race. That's a positive. Um, now it's his last race, I believe, uh, or at least I know he's retiring next year. So I, I get that side of it too, but um He's an example looking at that Met Mile where I, I don't want to say he wasn't in there to win because obviously he was. But, you know, at some point they knew, OK, flight line's gone. We are not winning this race. But he was clearly second. He was actually closing on flight line. I don't know that you can say that for any of flight line's other races. Now, as you said on the hardcore pod with Ron, he was never winning. So I don't say closing as if it was ever going to be close. But he was running at the end, whereas in other races that just doesn't happen against flight line. So there are some positives. And then going back to 2015 with American Pharaoh, who I believe is the shortest price classic winner uh, ever. Um, that was FNX. a big price. On, yes. FNX was the big price underneath. So there's sort of some precedents where how these races are run um, that, a horse like Happy Saber, who has plenty of credentials, it's not like it was a complete fluke, same with FNX, graded stakes winner, uh, can get the better of other horses who are either trying to win, like let's say Life is Good, his stable mate, or the, the flow of the race, uh, he happened to just get the better trip than Epicenter or Taba, and at a big, big price, uh, I'm with you. I mean, I, I think he is absolutely usable underneath. If he were to upset the field, 
more so than just that he beat flight line. Like I do not think he's better than life is good. I don't think epicenter or Tabor or worse than him at a mile and a quarter. So a win would really take it to another level, but underneath I absolutely get the case for as the longest shot on the board that he's worth playing more so than rich strike, who everyone's going to want as a closer. Exactly too. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's kind of my only way to find some way to bet this race because unless you're taking out the mortgage on flight line or you have a really strong opinion against flight line, I think that you you have to find somebody. And even, you know, your flight line life is good exact idea. It's going to pay more probably than, you know, flight line epicenter, flight line table perhaps as well. So, it's not totally chalking out in this race um and you'll you'll get a better price on that versus if you just bet flight line to win. And this is something I've done with Happy Saber so far this year. You know, the flight line Happy Saber Exacta paid okay because Speaker's Corner was a short price yep. in that race. And the Life is Good Happy Saber Exacta, you know, $5 turned into 70 for a race with a huge favorite that won the Whitney because Olympiad was a shorter price in a spot like that. And so was, you know, Hot Rod Charlie. So he runs his races. I can I can see why the fourth place finished last time. And I think that, you know, if that foot heals up okay, and obviously Todd won't even chance running him if it, if it doesn't and he's not 100% and good to go, um, I definitely want to include him somewhere underneath, though. I agree like you. I don't consider him a win candidate in the spot. And the one another sort of wrinkle, um, and it just depends on how the scoring shakes out and who's won what races and the leaderboard, but – with the BCBC ending in the classic, even though there's another race, but the BCBC itself ends in the classic um, and flight line being an overwhelming favorite who you know, there's plenty of races we've seen. You and I have talked about them. We've disagreed on them, agreed, whatever, but you have horses who are one to two, three to five that plenty of people are against or that, well, that's too short. And flight line certainly has a few detractors still our colleague, uh, Dr. Keith Bush being one of them uh, at the price. But for the most part, this is uh, most people are believers and they're going to be looking if they want to win the BCBC. I think far more people are going to be looking for cold punch exactas, even trifectas with flight line on top. And if they think, man, if I can get flight line Taba home and it's a $20,000 straight exacta, I can win the BCBC that's just going to further blow up the opportunity on happy saver underneath. Cause I don't think people are going to be playing these big numbers with him underneath. And that, that doesn't mean, Oh, he's the most likely to be second. Of course not. But um, the value is absolutely going to be there on him because of, I think in part the BCBC dynamics and, you know, there's a lot of talk about, Oh, if I'm single to flight line in the pick five, that'd be nice. And, you know, certainly I have, some looks in that direction, but from a, where does the price come from or the, you know, the thing to really maybe add some value to flight line, given my opinions throughout the day, since Moira is not in the pick five, uh, I actually think something like getting happy saver in the number could be more lucrative than, you know, trying to pick three with the, this staff and turf as a, for instance. Exactly. I mean, you got to try to find it somewhere. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It's the longest no, shot in the field. <laughs> and I do feel confident race, that he race will Race 12 be. awaits if you're wrong. <laughs> there is always another opportunity somewhere, somehow in racing. Uh, any final classic thoughts? Uh, no, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm expecting uh, a coronation. I, I feel like one of my strengths, I'm not, as we know, uh, you know, the, the race watching and replays and things like that. Um, I do think, though, that sort of trainer speak and body language over the years covering these races and, you know, getting to know the, the horsemen and women around the horses. Uh, I I was not expecting this John Sadler this week, and it, it's very reminiscent to me of uh, Bob Baffert, Belmont Week with American Pharaoh, uh, Bobby Frankel with Go Sapper. There, there's just sort of a a confidence there that's beyond the usual, like wouldn't trade places with anybody happy to be here type. Uh, John is very proud of the horse. He gets to, to lead over on Saturday and not that any of the other trainers shouldn't be being in the classic is enough to be proud of, but I just sense that John knows he's, he's got a powder keg and 
um, what a privilege that we get to be there to see it. I'm really looking forward to it. I think that uh, we're in for something very special uh, all, all through the Breeders' Cup, but especially in the Classic this year. And uh, what a Classic to be the first one that I get to see. Yeah, and you know, I was there for uh, both Zenyatta Classics and, you know, Santa Anita, the, the home court, so to speak, was amazing when she won. And at Churchill, I mean, she she was the favorite, literally, wagering-wise, but she had fans. I don't know that Flight, Flight Line has that fan base. I won't even say I don't know. He doesn't. Like, it's not the same as Zenyatta in that regard. And I would even go so far as to say, you know, Rich Strike has fans. Like, people are cheering for this horse to – do whatever he does um you know epicenter certainly with the asthmus like there, there are people that want to win this race um just beyond the financial and ownership connection situation so it's a little different there but if flight lines opening up in the stretch it's going to be a triple crown atmosphere i think at keeneland um as he you know run, runs home so I'm, I'm looking forward to it but i've been disappointed <laughs> before too by you know superstars and that's part of the game but uh yeah can't wait we'll see how it all unfolds thank you for taking the time you had to you didn't have a choice like all of these <laughs> other guest people i had i roped you into this one but it thank you for pleasure, taking the though. time well thank you <laughs> well, for doing it uh, all of these i've already uh watched jason and barry uh so it just makes me look forward to the other 11 i probably won't watch this one back because i hate the sound of my voice but I'll give Do you think it a that like. that's a thing? Um, I, because, I mean, don't we all? Does anyone actually really like their own voice? I think so. You think so? Hmm. I mean, I like my hmm. jokes. Well. <laughs> uh, Ed Rosa, Sarah Albadwe here from Horse Racing Nation. We're in for quite a Breeders' Cup classic. Thank you for tuning in, and good luck in the Breeders' Cup.